Hi, I'm George Gillespie. I'm passionate about American history, and in today's video, I will be discussing Article 2 of the United States Constitution, the Executive Branch. Article 2, Section 1 of the United States Constitution says that the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years and together with the vice president chosen for the same term. Every four years, the United States will hold a presidential election, but unlike how we elect our governors, senators, representatives, or other elected officials to public office, the president isn't directly elected by the people. Instead, the president is elected by the Electoral College, a group of electors who are appointed by the state legislatures. Article 2, Section 1 says that each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress, but no senator or representative or person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States shall be appointed an elector. Each state will receive two electoral votes for the two senators they have, and this gives the smaller and least populated states equal representation with the much larger and more populated states. The rest of the votes are determined by the number of representatives a state has. In the 2016 presidential election, there were a total of 538 electoral votes distributed among the 50 states and in the District of Columbia. The electors are to vote in their respective states with Congress choosing the time and day for when they shall give their votes, and they are free to vote for any person they want. Usually, the electors will vote for the candidate whom the majority of their state has voted for. However, there are exceptions. In 2016, Hillary Clinton lost four electoral votes in Washington State, a state she had won, with three electors who instead voted for the former Secretary of State Colin Powell and one who voted for the Native American activist Spotted Eagle. For a candidate to win, they'd have to win a majority of the electoral votes, 270. If there is a tie, or if none of the candidates win a majority of the electoral votes needed to become president, the election then goes to the House of Representatives, where the votes are taken by states, with each state having one vote, and the candidate who wins a majority of the states becomes president. This has happened twice before, first in the presidential election of 1800, when the House of Representatives helped break the tie between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr, electing Jefferson president, and second in the presidential election of 1824, when the House of Representatives elected John Quincy Adams president, after he, Andrew Jackson, William Crawford, and Henry Clay didn't win a majority of the electoral votes. To be president, you have to be a natural-born citizen, have lived in the United States for 14 years and be 35 years of age or older. The youngest man to ever become president was Theodore Roosevelt, who on September 14, 1901, assumed office at the age of 42 following the assassination of President William McKinley. If the president dies in office, resigns, or is removed from office, the powers and duties of the said office shall devolve upon the vice president. The president's powers are listed in Article 2, Section 2. The President is Commander-in-Chief of the Military, and in Federalist Papers No. 46, Alexander Hamilton explained that, as Commander-in-Chief, the President would amount to nothing more than the supreme command and direction of the military and naval forces as First General and Admiral of the Confederacy. Once the President has gotten authorization from Congress, he can direct where the military can attack as, for example, what President Harry S. Truman did during the Second World War when he ordered the atomic bomb to be dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The President may require the opinion in writing from his cabinet upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices, grant reprieves and pardons, except while under impeachment, and has the power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, make treaties with foreign nations, and nominate ambassadors other public ministers, Supreme Court justices, and all other officers of the United States. 
While the Senate is in recess, the President can temporarily fill up all vacancies till the end of their next session. Next, we get to Section 3, which lists what responsibilities the President has. From time to time, the President can give Congress information of the State of the Union where he can make recommendations for their consideration and, on extraordinary occasions, he can convene both houses or either of them. The President also can receive ambassadors and other public ministers, and he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. The Take Care Clause gives the President the responsibility to enforce all the laws that have been passed by Congress, and he will execute this duty through the executive departments under his administration and other agencies of the federal government. In response to the steep resistance over the federal excise tax on whiskey by farmers in western Pennsylvania, President George Washington asserted in a letter to his Treasury Secretary, It is my duty to see the laws executed to permit them to be trampled upon if impunity would be repugnant to that duty. The fourth and final section outlines how the President can be removed from office, and it says that, the President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Only three Presidents, Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, and Donald Trump, have faced impeachment. In 1868, President Johnson was impeached by the House of Representatives for violating the Tenure of Office Act which prohibited the president from removing federal officials without the consent of the Senate following his dismissal of Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. In 1998, President Clinton was impeached by the House of Representatives, first on the grounds for committing perjury before a grand jury over having sexual relations with a White House intern and for trying to cover the affair up, and second, for obstructing justice towards the civil lawsuit and the grand jury proceedings. And most recently, in 2019, President Trump was impeached by the House of Representatives for soliciting the Ukrainian government to investigate the former vice president and 2020 Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, whose son had served on the board of a Ukrainian gas company, and for obstructing Congress by directing his staff to defy lawful subpoenas and withhold the production of documents and records from the committees. In the end, all three presidents would be acquitted by the Senate. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, then please subscribe for more upcoming videos about U.S. presidents.